Hello and welcome back. We've been cruising along learning about the algorithm for automating the selection of a temperature dependent change point model. And in the last three videos we've covered the three tests that make this algorithm go. Shape test, significant test, and data population test. And so for those of you who may have just joined late, let me just reiterate what these were all about. We start with the shape test, and so let me scroll down a little bit. What we have here is, is all of the sample things that are good and not good. So for, say for instance, the 5P model, there were four different shapes you could end up with, and only one of those makes sense if you have a sloped downward section to begin with and it slopes up with with some constant in the middle for the 4p models only these three on the left side make sense if you have model fits that look like these they don't they don't work if you continue these on they'll cross the x the zero zero energy axis and that's no good whereas this looks as though it's curving and just not getting to zero which is what we would like. So for three, this is a 3PC model. We don't want this going down. And if I scroll down some, do that a little better. For this one here, we also don't want this going down towards zero. So that was the first, first test. That, that is what we called the shape test. The second test was the significance test. So if we have a slope section, so say for instance a slope section, it needs to be sloped enough. This has to be, that slope has to be greater than some threshold. Threshold, that's not a T, that's an L. And we decided, or we found that a T stat greater than two, that's good. So if you ended up getting a model that had a slope just ever so slightly different from zero, that also gets a big red no. So that's the second. And the final test was the data population test. So we were trying to not have problems like this where, yes, that model fit well, had the right shape. So that shape right there matches this shape here. So that's, that got a green check mark. Both these slopes are plenty sloped enough, so that passes the second test, but this section here is troublesome. It is not realistic for if you had a temperature below 20 here, we would not expect this behavior in our electricity use for this building. So the last test is we require at least 25% of the data points to be part of a slope section here. It only had one, so this is a no. And we said over here, if you just had these two, that would be a no. But if you had the third one, then you have a yes. And so those are the three tests that we have. So how do we combine them into the algorithm? Well, here is the flow chart that was in the paper. So a 5P model, as its name clearly states, has five parameters. And that has more parameters than the other ones, four parameters and three parameters and two parameters. And so it's guaranteed actually to have a better model fit than the other ones, but solely by the sake of it having more parameters. It's the same as if you have a higher order polynomial and you're approximating a function or power series that you're going to be better off. <clears throat> and if you have a polynomial of high enough order, if you have as many data points, you can actually go through each one of the data points and have zero error. But that model doesn't make sense. So what we do is we start with a model that would give us the best overall fit, but then we verify that it makes sense. So you start with whatever data you have and you try a 5P model. If it has the right shape, has significant slopes and has enough data in each of those slope sections, if they all pass, go ahead and use it. Actually, I'll do that color in green because that's a good thing. You can go ahead 
and use it. If not, that pass, if it doesn't pass all three, then you move on to the 4P model. And then you check, okay, does the 4P model pass all tests? If it does, use it. If not, go to the next lower one. And between 3P cooling and 3P heating, it doesn't matter actually what order you have them in uh, because they're, they're kind of dichotomous. If one passes, the other one would be guaranteed to fail. And if the 3P models don't pass, go ahead and the, as a very last resort, go ahead and just use a standard straight line fit through the data. So actually let's, let me, I, in that paper I have an example showing how this is actually applied to a real data set. So let me grab a few screenshots. So let me scroll down and let me copy a uh, figure over. So let me go ahead and bring, this was the data that we had and this was the first model fit. And so this is a five parameter model. So you can see here's one slope section constant and another slope section with two temperature change points. And we go ahead and we start checking off our tests. Does this pass the shape test? I hope you can see that no, it doesn't. It does not pass the shape test because of this section right here. This section is sloped downward. We need that to go upward for it to make sense. Would it have passed the significance test? Yes, it would have. This is very high slope, and this is also has, just visually looking at it, it would have passed the significance test, but it also would have failed the data population test. Because look, this slope section only has two points in it, and look how vertical that line gets. So. Yes, this has actually a very good model fit in terms of the error metric, but we don't want to use that. So what do we do? We, if we follow the algorithm, we go ahead and we now try regressing the data using a four parameter model. So let me grab that chart. Sorry, I'm bouncing around a little bit. So let's grab four parameter model. So here's the four parameter model. So as you can see, let me get my mouse back. Let's go through our tests again. Does it pass the shape test? Shape test? Yes, it does. It has two positive slopes, and this slope is greater than this slope. So if I drew a curve, it would look like it's going to not cross the zero axis. Does it pass the significance test? Actually, yes, it does. This is very, has plenty of slope. This has plenty of slope. Again, the T statistics give us a little better indication of that, but just visually I can tell that that's going to be significant. The last test, data population, fails. So again, here we have a very high sloped section, which only has two points in it. And so that it does not indicate really what the, the typical trend of this data is, which is something like that. So this model, 4P model, no. So we move on to the next one. And now just for the sake of doing it, I'm going to bring in the 3P heating model first. Normally it doesn't really matter, but normally in code I, for some reason, am biased towards the cooling. I usually do that one first, but here... This one, we'll go through them in our heads. The shape test. Nope, this doesn't pass the shape test, so immediately could have X'd that one out. Significant, yes. Data population, yes, because we really don't care about this. We weren't talking about the flat section so much. So, let's go on to the next one. Don't know why my smooth draw is bouncing around. So let me do that. So I've brought up the 3PC model for this same data set. And now what you'll see is that this one is going to pass. Does it pass the shape test? Yes, it does. Does it pass the significance test? Yes, it does. 
Does it pass the data population test? Yes, it does. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in that slope section. And so this is the model we would go ahead and use for this particular data set. And so what you could see is that we used these various tests to, to help us out, and they were all shown to be useful. Here, the shape test came in. Here, the data population test came in. Here, uh, the shape test came in. And so when we get to this point, we know that we have a very robust model in the sense that we're not going to have a slope that typically goes very extreme unless that really is the trend for some reason. And this method you know, goes to hourly data fairly well. It could be adapted for that or sub-hourly data. We've used this here at the Energy Systems Lab, where I reside at the moment, for about two years now, and this has not been changed in those two years because it's been found to be so robust in its choices, and it provides a level of consistency and determinism, and determinism in these choices that sometimes aren't present. And when these models are being used to predict thousands of dollars of savings, it's important that your choice of the model is as standardized as possible. And so I hope you see the usefulness and how to apply this yourself if you would like to do some of this. And in the next video, in the next maybe two videos, we'll go over just what the final results in this application were in that paper. So see you in the next video.